expectations on Europe. Now, um, Alicia um, Garcia Herrero, our senior fellow who is introducing, is, um, I think, in the taxi arriving any minute. So that's why um, I thought uh, we, we start nevertheless, because we are already um, 15 minutes uh, delayed. Um, so, so perhaps in, uh, as a way of introducing, let me just say two, three words. I think um, what, what um, one of the motivations for um, this topic here is that um, uh, the China-Russia relations have many different implications also for um, the European Union. I mean, depending on, uh, and Jian Wei has written with Alicia a wonderful uh, uh, piece or has worked on a wonderful research piece also showing that um, the uh, um, exports to Russia and to China um, are substitutes uh, or complements uh, to, uh, to the exports from, from the European Union. So uh, clearly in terms of trade relations, um, the relations between China and Russia also matter for the relations between um, the European Union and China and the European Union and Russia. And that's just an example from the trade side. Of course, this goes further. There's also the dimension of financial flows, and there's the dimension of, um, uh, I guess, um, I guess uh, beyond financial and trade, also foreign direct investment flows, really. Uh, and so I think we have today a wonderful program that um, uh, covers um, uh, different aspects of this, in the increasing interdependence, but also divergent, uh, similar challenges and divergent uh, solutions. So I think we have really two, uh, two, three, three wonderful panels plus a policy panel, um, and I very much look forward uh, to the discussion today. Um, and I think what we will do is we will just start um, with the first panel. And um, I think uh, let me also uh, thank um, um, our friends from uh, from Bofit who've been very uh, much uh, co-organizing um, this this conference and you know giving input to. Um, to, uh, to the program and have many speakers here on the program also. And so I think um, I very much look forward to the great discussion today. Marek, perhaps I give the floor to you for uh, chairing the first panel. Thank you very much, Guntram. Um, I am Marek Dombrowski, uh, non-resident fellow in Bruegel. And also I, I think on this occasion I must admit that in my previous life I was um, a visiting fellow in Bofit, so it's my great pleasure to, to be able to chair this session. Um, uh, my understanding is that the role of the first session is to uh, provide uh, audience with some basic analysis of where, uh, what kind of challenges um, are faced by both Russia and China. As, uh, as Tides uh, suggests, there are to some degree similar, but solutions which are um, uh, proposed in both countries are very often uh, different. Uh, so let me uh, introduce uh, my friend Laura Solanko, who is senior economist in Bofit, and who will uh, give us uh, the basic presentation on, 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 on this topic. Laura, is your floor. Thank you, Marek. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to provide a, a few, few thoughts to open up the, this uh, very interesting event. So what I will, I will try to do, I'll, I'll present you a few issues on where Russia and China do, do differ and where they were a few issues on where they actually are not all that different. And then, then I'll, I'll highlight some, some of the solutions to the, the challenges that are strikingly different in these two countries. And I hope this will, this will work as, as a good starting point for our discussions, provide some food for thought for further, further, um, further discussions. Uh, a word of caution is in order, in a sense that I will focus very much on the very broad macro level with the least de level of details. And as you all know, the devil is in the details. And I'm sure we'll learn much of, much of those during 
during the day later on. Uh, so, to, to get started, um, pardon me. No, um, okay, if you... It's not, you are not the first person who is struggling okay, with our the, new... Well, it's, I think it's, uh, okay. Who <laughs> is our new uh, audiovisual equipment. Okay, excellent. So, uh, quite in, in many occasions, Russia and China are actually presented as, as uh, two economies that are impossible to compare. One is uh, large, one is small. One is large by population, another, another large by geographical area. Uh, they are, they are, one is, one is an almost a high income country, one is, one is a developing economy starting from very poor foundations. And therefore, it may be good to remind us of, of the GDP structure of these two economies. The, the Russian GDP structure is very typical for a higher middle income country with the share of services about 60% of GDP, uh, a fairly minor share for, for agriculture in the tune of 4% and the rest, rest is, is industry. Now then, given the extremely rapid growth in China over the last decades, the GDP structure of China has in, indeed changed quite a bit. So that currently the share of services in Chinese GDP is almost 50%. And given the uncertainties in measuring services, there are many experts who do claim that the real weight of services actually should be much higher in China. So these are sort of these are not all that dissimilar in the structure. And they are certainly much more similar than they used to be 20 years ago. And that's, that is due to the rapid growth and development in China. Not so much of, of anything has been happening in, in Russia in terms of GDP structure at, the, at this, this level of detail. Um, now the, the share of services in EU on average is 74%. So one may wonder whether Russia is more similar to an EU structure of GDP or actually more similar to Chinese GDP. That's, um, I think it's at least not self-evident we should not outright label these economies as, as completely of a different animals. There's, there's, um, they, are, they are not necessarily that different and, and they are growing more similar. Both are very large countries both are, are, are composed of several regions or provinces or republics, the way you wish to call them in, in respective countries. And in both countries do have a, a serious issue on regional inequality, on the discrepancies between, between regions. In, in China, this is about rural and urban, about the coastal regions and inland. In Russia, it's, it's about about Caucasus regions of the si Siberian and about the heartland Russia. And, and I don't know how, how many of you actually, actually do um, have an idea of whether regional differences in per capita GDP are larger in Russia or China. I think, think uh, that for, um, well, no, we missed one. Uh, in fact, measured as nominal GDP per capita, regional differences in Russia are much wider than in China. Russia is geographically a huge country with huge <coughs> regional differences. Now then, we may discuss on, on how much nominal figure really tells about the standard of living. There are no PPP adjusted figures for Russian regions <coughs> readily available. And, um, but having those figures would certainly even out the difference. But anyhow, it may be good to remind ourselves that Russia is, is a huge country with significant regional differences. Um, that may be partly linked to another feature 
that are sometimes overlooked in our thinking of thinking of China as being a developing country and Russia as being, being a um, higher middle income country or a high income country. The standard of living in, um, in some respects is maybe actually better in China than in Russia. Um, life expectancy in China is significantly higher than in Russia. Has been, that has been the case for the last two decades. The, the explanation here is that, that the life expectancy at birth for males in Russia is very low. The, the uh, difference in life expectancy for females is practically non-existent when comparing these two countries. So Russia does have a demographic problem that we'll come, come back to later on. But there are, there are some, some surprising issues where maybe may be useful to, to bear in mind. Then the, um, then the, uh, the, the real issue were, were also, also the discrepancies are increasingly visible in policy side is the op openness to trade. Um, when, when measuring openness to trade uh, with just a very, very crude measure of imports and exports in relation to GDP, Russia and China are more or less equally open. For, for both countries, the uh, exports and imports to GDP are about 50%. And, um, and that that's, uh, makes them more or less as open as the European Union, but much more open than other large economies like, like the US or Brazil. So, so we're, we're talking about two fairly open economies. Uh, later today, we'll be discussing the figures also in, in trading value added. And those may, may show that actually Russia is the one that's much more dependent on, on foreign trade and uh, especially on, on foreign demand and trade than China is, which makes, makes sense. Um, the share of uh, imports to, to GDP in Russia has been remarkably stable over the period of the last 15 years, whereas the GDP has fluctuated widely. So that what this actually means is that when Russian GDP has contracted, also imports have contracted, keeping the share roughly on a similar level, whereas in China, imports and exports are very closely linked through processing trade. So, so there's, there's certainly much, much more nuances in the nature of, of foreign trade. But on a very, very broadly speaking, both are open economies dependent on, on foreign trade. They both have been running current account surpluses um, on, on a varying degree. For Russia, that has been a, very much of a function of the current oil price. Um, so that's it. Then, then now thinking on terms of foreign financial flows, China has been heralded as the magnet of FDI for FDI for the last 15 years or two decades. We all know that China has received large amounts of FDI and, uh, and uh, foreign, foreign investments have been essential, especially in the processing trade in the early, early 2000s and also later on. Whereas Russia is fairly often portrayed as, um, if not hostile, at least not entirely welcoming of foreign investments. Uh, but the picture is not entirely true. If we uh, try to move to the next picture, which requires a bit of technical skills. Okay, now we are there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, if we relate the FDI flows to the size of their respective economies, which is shown, shown in the pictures here, actually FDI to Russia should be much larger than FDI to China. 
So it's not entirely true to portray Russia as an economy where FDI would not play a role. Uh, that's that's the, the figure here is, is FDI inflows, so it's, it's annual inflows, but also the, uh, the current stock of FDI. Um, it's not, not sort of, a, there are even instances in 2007 <coughs> and 2008 when, when uh, if relying on the UNCTAD data, the, the stock of FDI in Russia was actually at the same, same levels than the stock in China. Now there, the clue of course is that the, uh, a large share of the stock of FDI in Russia goes to oil and gas sectors and that's the valuation of those stock vary according to, to where the oil price happens to be. But nevertheless, that's, that's one point I wish to wish for, for us all to, to remember when, when sort of continuing the discussions today. Uh, then when speaking about oil and gas, maybe the, the final last comment on oil and gas sectors, Russia is the uh, number one global oil producer, number two gas producer, uh, number, number two oil exporter, and so forth. And Russia very often likes to portray itself as an energy superpower capa capable on, on, on sort of a, a many, many exploration projects there. But we tend to f forget that also China is a major oil producer. China is the global number four. And the refining capacities in China are more than twice the refining capacities in Russia. So it's not entirely, entirely correct either to label China as just an energy consumer and Russia as an energy producer. In, in fact, both, both Russia and China do have a big role to play also in production, exploration, uh, and refining. And one, one sort of a common feature for both is the state plays a very big role in both countries in the, in the energy sectors in the, in the whole, whole chain of energy production. So these are, these are some of the features we may wish to, wish to bear in mind when continuing the discussions. Uh, now then, the, um, both Russia and China have experienced clear growth slowdown from radically different levels, though. China is, China is adjusting to double-digit growth to something that may be closer to 4 to 5% in, in the medium term, whereas Russia is, is making a transition from, from a potential growth rate of uh, somewhere around 4% to, to uh, somewhere around 1% to 2% currently. Uh, there, there are various reasons for the growth slowdown in both countries, and no, no time to do, go deeper there, but certainly issues, uh, the, these are both open economies dependent on, on foreign trade and foreign financial flows, so, so what happens in, in the global trade and global economy certainly has a great de facto then. Then they both do have internal structural issues linked to the role of the state in the economy. In China, it's about the role of the state on the enterprises, about the overcapacities, about overinvestments in certain sectors. In Russia, it's about too little investments. Uh, it's about, about the role of, of the state controlled enterprises in many sectors. But where they, they, uh, the, um, where they are similar is that they both face a demographic decline of, of working age population. Working age population in, in Russia started already to decline and it will, according to, to projections, start to decline in, in China next year. We know that the, the cohorts that will come into working age in the next 15 years have already been born. So that's, that's something we know for pretty sure. I don't think the labor shortage will be a problem for either of these countries. China still has uh, the possibilities of, of further ur urbanization, but that is going to, going to push up the wage rates. Whereas in Russia, has still, uh, Russia still is a major migration destination. There is a pool of, significant pool of potential migrants in non-oil non producing Caucasus and Central Asian republics 
they certainly are, are willing, to, willing to migrate to Russia if, if need be. But that's going to, to together with the, with the uh, age profile, that's going to, to pose serious troubles for the pension systems. Now then, given, given all these, these, these um, both similarities and dissimilarities, it's, it's um, shocking to see how different, differently these two countries uh, view global trade integration and the bene potential benefits of being part of a global trade organization. And that's, that's uh, very briefly something I wish to wish to, to remind ourselves of. So China became a member in late 2001. Uh, also, Russia was almost about to become a member at, at, at around the same time. It's 2002, 2003, Russia was about to conclude the last remaining bilateral uh, negotiations. There, was high, there were high hopes that Russia will as well join the organization. Uh, that just then did not break through. There, uh, break through. And, and there, for China at the time, there was uh, clearly benefits to be reaped from becoming a WTO member, of gaining, gaining access to, to export markets and lowering the trade barriers. China at the time of joining the WTO was already a significant exporter nation. So it, it was also number seven global exporter at 2000. Whereas Russia at the time of entering the WTO was, was number 11 or 12, if, I'm, if I recall correctly. So, so these, these are, are two, two different things and therefore the benefits for China were much more clear than benefits for Russia. And eventually, eventually it turned out that for Russia, Russia finally joining WTO, it evidently was much more of a fact of being a member in the club than reaping the benefits. For China, being a member in WTO has always been an integral part of an openly stated goal of of opening up the economy and liberalizing it and, and sort of using the membership in WTO as a push to further push up domestic competitiveness. Whereas in Russia, um, they have, have been trying to work hard to find sort of a documents mentioning, official documents sort of mentioning that WTO membership as something that we want to have in order to improve our own competitiveness. Uh, I think a good example of, of, the, of the differences is attitude are, are, are in these two quotes, which are from more or less of the same point in time, China being a member already for 10 years, and Russia just entering the, the organization. Uh, the, the hopes, hopes in, in Russia have not been, not been high. And, and, and unsurprisingly, <coughs> since the benefits of WTO only accrue if you really use the membership as a, as a boost as a, or as an anchor, there's, there's no automatic guarantee that the member in, in, in a trading block would become, per se, more competitive or more efficient. Um, Russia agreed to decrease the tariff levels when joining, joining, but since since then, sort of the track record of Russia is not not been impressive. It was a member in the organization for 11 months before the first dispute case against Russia was raised. For China, it took about three and a half years before the first dispute case against China was raised. Uh, moreover, Russian, Russian trade policies seem to, over time, have become, been becoming more discriminatory, not less. This is data from, from the Global Trade Alert database to comparing, comparing these two countries on the number of measures introduced that, that do influence foreign commercial interests. And it's clear that Russia has been much more active in using 
using all sorts of, of measures to protect itself from foreign competition instead of embracing competition, instead of uh, allowing competition and taking benefits from it, Russia has been increasingly sort of, uh, trying to protect itself from competition. That's, that has been, has been a clear trend. And that's, uh, I think that's where, where there's an interesting dissimilarity between these two countries. I do not have a good and final answers on why that is the case and what drives the, the differences. I think that's something we need to discuss during the day. But this is where these countries differ. This, both our large economies dependent on, on foreign trade. One is, is using foreign trade as an anchor to further liberalize and open up its economy. The other is doing its best to protect itself and increase the trade barriers. Uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the big dis discrepancy that also shows up in the OECD trade facilitation indicators where China, in mo along most, most of the dimensions, China ranks much better than Russia. Also, also uh, linked to this is the share of uh, high technology exports in total manufacturing exports. Of course, manufacturing exports in Russia are a very tiny share of foreign trade to start with. But e even there, in the early 2000s, the differences were not very, very large. The, the share of high tech exports was somewhere between 15 to 20 percent in both countries. But since the discrepancies have started to grow and they, they seem to be growing further. So these is where large differences are. And I think this, this is where I, I uh, intended, to <coughs> intended to have the last slide, but we'll forget about it. <laughs> OK, uh, so, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. I would like to turn now to my colleague, Jan Weik Su, who is a Bruegel Visiting Fellow and Associate Professor in Beijing Normal University. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to give comments on this very interesting paper. I received the slides yesterday, and uh, but it's very intuitive because uh, some of the materials are even brand new for me. So I got to say that uh, I learned quite a lot from the slides. And today I would like to give more some supplements to the slides because uh, I think there are some additional information that is uh, also very important to give a full picture of the relations between China and Russia. And um, one thing that you have mentioned in the very beginning is the sector development in between China and Russia. You mentioned that uh, in, you know, of course, you know, China and Russia has a very low degree of uh, uh, value-added share of GDP in agricultural sector. But, uh, you know, when I dig into the data and uh, if you check the employment share within the three sectors, you will find a completely different story. About 29% uh, of Chinese population is now in agricultural sector, whereas there are only maybe 9% uh, less than 10 percent of the population that is in the agricultural sector. That means in China we call this surplus labor in the sense that China has a lot of, although you see China has a very developed economy in the modern sectors, but mo so there are also a reservoir, a big, a large amount of people that are still in the agricultural sector. And actually those are inefficient, more labor, surplus labors in the agricultural sectors. So this means that China, compared with Russia, still have some potential to move those surplus labor from agricultural sector to the modern sector to boost development. This is the one thing that is different between China and Russia. And the second thing that if you look at the uh, manufacturing sector, the, the value added of the value ma ma manufacturer sector in China, of course, is lower than Russia. But if you take a look at the population comparison in the two sectors, the, in manufacturer sector, those two sectors are very, very similar. So we have, a, in China, we have 29% of population working force in 
manufacturing sector, and in Russia, there are about 27% of the population. And you can also see that maybe you see the manufacturer, uh, the proportion of manufacturer in value added is smaller than Russia, but in terms of ag aggregate absolute magnitude, the manufacturers in China is more developed than Russia. That implies that compared with Russia, China is um, more developed in manufacture in terms of productivity. So this is the one thing that I think that contrast China from Russia, that China has surplus labor, we still have some potential in the economy, and in the meantime, we still have a large manufacturing sector that is still promising, although it's slowed down a little bit, still promising compared with Russia. But that does not mean that uh, those two China is uh, in every aspect uh, that uh, has more economic growth potential than Russia. Uh, in terms of the, if you look at the skill composition of the labor market in the two countries, you will find that uh, although the fertility rate in China is lower, and um, although that uh, we have seen some and larger share of the labor labor supply in China, the skilled labor in Russia is much higher than skilled labor in, in China. Um, because uh, in China, the enrollment rate for tertiary, the tertiary enrollment rate in China is less than 30%. That means out of the whole population, be above uh, nine, uh, 30 Above above 15 years old, there are no, only then this 30 then 30 percent of the workforce that can get into the university into the tertiary degree. Whereas in Russia, the same, the number reaches 70 percent. So Russia has a great potential in service sector. I think this is one potential reason because people are more educated, and uh, in manufacturing sector, I still think that Russia has its potential because in China, although we are we have a large share of the so-called high technology exports in the export in China's exports, but uh, most of them has lower value added in China because um, we import most of the key high technology um, material and uh, some intellectuals from the, from the rest of the world. Most of the time, the China is uh, to put things together and re-export to the rest of the country. So this means that in terms of value added, and uh, China's value added in those high technology products <laughs> is not as good as Russia. So I didn't look at the detailed trade composition between China and Russia, but I still think that Russia has some potential because of its labor. I think labor, skilled labor is very important to enhance technology. So in this respect, Russia has its comparative advantage in those high-tech products. Whereas in China, we are still a very traditional economy and uh, we need to upgrade. So transformation is more important in, in China than Russia. We need to supply more skilled labor to the market to increase the probability, proportion of the tertiary school students so that uh, the economy can catch up with the Russia in this respect. So this is my supplement to your presentation. Thank you very much. Now we have approximately 20, 25 minutes time for discussion. So um, the floor is open for questions, for comments. Uh, everybody who would like to take floor is kindly asked to introduce her or himself. Please. Any? Who is the first? Okay, please. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. My name is Pavel, Free University of Brussels. Uh, my question is about uh, gas sector. Uh, there uh, is a huge contract. There was a huge contract about um, gas uh, supplies from Russia to China signed before. And what's going on in this situation? And could this, uh, these developments, recent developments, affect uh, 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 impact on Europe? Because Russia is a huge exporter of gas. 
is exporting its gas to Europe and other countries. So my question about uh, this cooperation between China and Russia in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am not totally sure that this question belongs to thematic scope of this session, but, but I would not like to limit. Um, okay, any other uh, question? Okay, Alicia, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and I apologize for the delay, but I was stuck uh, because of security, uh, given what's going on in the city. But uh, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. I have a question, uh, and uh, as I know that Bofit is really an expert on both China and Russia, uh, but given the closeness of Russia to your reality, I'd like to understand better how you perceive whether you know you perceive a change in Russia's uh, economic structure due to China, i.e., uh, and you know, with my Latin American background, uh, you do feel that there's been kind of a Dutch disease induced by China in the Latin American economies, becoming much more dependent on commodities and and therefore feeling now very much the, the China slowdown and, and its indirect impact on commodity prices. But how much of, the, uh, of Russia's economic structure has really been affected by China's booming economy since en the entry in WTO? How, how have you perceived that change, if, if, if at all, in Russia's economic structure? And how much do you think is due to China? Thank you. Any other questions or comments at this stage, please? Thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Papa. I'm associated with SEPS here, formerly with the Commission. I found it very interesting that Mr. Chu mentioned this labor surplus in the agro sector. I wonder how far the skill lack, apparently in comparison to Russia, there's an enormous lack of skills, is uh, contributing to this lack of moving because there's enormous migration within China from the rural sector into the urban sector. Is it the skills that are needed or what is the problem that these people are still in agriculture? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Amoni. I'm a, uh, still advising the European External Action Service and also I'm a member of the European Institute for Asian Studies. Uh, two or three questions. Uh, one is uh, the role of the defense industry. Do you have sign of transfer of technology from Russia to China uh, to develop aerospace or to develop uh, defense-related uh, uh, industrial activities, uh, armaments or whatever? The second question is uh, um, the uh, Russian interest in the in the, Asian, uh, uh, in the Asian Infrastructure uh, uh, Investment Bank uh, created, or the BRICS Bank uh, created by China. Do you have a sign that uh, Russia is uh, committed, is interested in developing infrastructures financed by these uh, two banks? Uh, a third issue is uh, uh, China and Siberia. Uh, China is very much interested to, to develop uh, the raw materials and uh, natural resources of Siberia. There are about one million Chinese already settled in Siberia, uh, the Asian part of Russia. Uh, do you think that this, uh, this is an important element for the development of Russia and also for the uh, access of China to raw materials? Uh, the, the border between China and Siberia is underpopulated. There is a practically empty spaces. And in the midst, there is also Mongolia over there. So, I mean, how do you see this, uh, this Chinese interest in, uh, in, the, in the eastern Siberia? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps I will give floor to the speakers to answer this first round of questions, if it will be any further question, really. Come back to audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your comments and, and for all the questions. Um, if I uh, so some of the questions are really much tightly, much more tightly related in to, to Russia China relations and, and we will 
we'll be discussing those more more deeply in the next session. So I'll, I'll touch them on, on, on very on, on, only on a very briefly on the question of our question of gas gas pipelines. The the um, that's something uh, that uh, as of yet does not exist. So so we're just speaking about plans and prospects. And uh, on 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 the effect on Europe, there are probably two issues worth remembering. One is that the gas basis for supplies to China would not be the basis that supply Europe. So in 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 that sense, there is not a trade-off trade-off in resource-wise. Russia may may in in that way perfectly well provide natural gas both for for west and and for the east the uh, the competition may arise in in terms of financial resources of how much Russia then would be interested and capable of funding funding both large exploration work in Siberia and in Europe but currently there is really not much of a competition in that either the production facilities that do feed into European pipelines could produce much more than they do at the time. So I don't see very much of a competition effect that, that would have an immediate effect on, on European supply there. Um, then on Alicia's excellent question, I, I, I think that's a question I sort of uh, will need to need to think think a a while, and I think that's that's a very good one. Um, Russia has certainly benefited from China's demand in raw materials in terms of increasing prices, uh, but the effect certainly is not as large as it has been in Latin America, due to the reason that since mid 2000, since say around 2005, Russia has, especially in the oil sector, producing, has been producing at full capacity. So there's, there's sort of a, Russia has not invested massively in new fields, in new production. Russia has not adjusted production volumes according, depending on China's demand. So therefore there's much, Russia has much, been much less responsive, if you wish, <laughs> in, in, in this way. On, on China's demand. The role of China certainly has increased in, in Russia's imports, but that's, that's something we'll be discussing, and Heli will be discussing that in much more detail, so I think that, that we may, may leave for, for a while, and unless you want to bring up some remarks right now, <laughs> okay. Um, so, but that's that's so. So, as a very brief conclusion, I don't see large effects in the structure of Russian economy that would 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 originate from the rise of China. But that's that is a very very good question. Need need to to think th further. Um, and the role of defense industry industry that's a tricky question since uh, <laughs> defense industry almost by definition is something we don't know very much about. <laughs> and um, on, um, and somehow in, in, during the last, last years in Russia, there has been lots of policy talk about defense industry being the driver for modernization, the defense industry being, being the sector that's, that's going to going to push for modernization along the along many lines. Russians are occasionally talking about uh, a similar idea of the, the US experience in the 1960s of having a Silicon Valley with military military <coughs> sort of technologies spilling over to the rest of the economy. Uh, there, I must say, I'm a fairly <coughs> skeptical as, as the little I know of the US story is that the essential ingredients in, in that were a number of small private companies supplying the military with various gadgets, 
and then the uh, very, very intense contacts between the academia and private business. And I think these two dimensions are, are something that Russia is particularly poor at. So, so I think the replicating, replicating that story is, is bound to be very, very difficult. Uh, uh, China is most evidently rapidly approaching the technological level of Russia. So it may very well be that in a few years, China is losing the interest in arms procurement from Russia as they have been able to build the, their own capacities of that. Um, Russia has not been particularly interested in in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, it took, took a long while for Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union to formulate a position towards the One Road, One Belt initiatives and the Silk, China Silk Road initiatives. Finally, the conclusion was positive. Yes, R Russia is willing to cooperate and coordinate, but, uh, but there, there's sort of uh, very little concrete things happening that, that would, would really make Russia an active partner in, the, in those initiatives. That may change, though. Um, then on the last, last issue about China and Russia's Far East, or Siberia, as you, as you put it, um, the Russia's Far East is very thinly populated area, as we all know. With the uh, and, and the same is not true on the Chinese provinces on the other side of the border, and there is great deal of of suspicion on the Russian side towards the Chinese and towards the possibilities of attracting Chinese investments into the region. And at least part of that reluctance certainly stems from the from the perceived perceived uh, unbalance in, or imbalance in in the sciences sciences of the economies on the both sides of the of the border. There, <coughs> China has now lately been been successful in sort of a getting getting a share in a few oil and gas projects in Russia, and that clearly, clearly is something China is interested in and for very natural reasons. Um, but the process so far has been very, very slow and uh, probably dictated more by the need for financing from the Russian side than from any strategic willingness to have a close cooperation on the matters. I guess that's um, and then. But then we had the the question on, on labor. Yeah. Uh, so do you, what do you like? To yeah. Uh, just a very quick response. Uh, China, of course, um, I have mentioned that we have migration from a rural to urban area every year, and there's a huge, huge amount of people, but. Uh, in terms of the quality, you can see that the education in rural area is far below the average in urban area. So that implies China's skilled labor, the number of skilled labor is far behind the world av developed average. And um, there are several issues that uh, why this is important uh, for both China's development and uh, our collaboration with Russia and with the EU economies. Because uh, you can see that uh, one of the things that you can see China is upgrading in the sense that China invested more and more on R&D investment. You can see the number of R&D is not catching up with the EU economies. And so it's a big number. But on the other side, the skilled labor is far behind. And uh, there are three reasons I think that contributes to this important lack of skilled labor. First uh, is, um, um, is that the most of the 
rural area is um, scattered across the country, so the population density in that area is very low. It's uh, very expensive for the government to invest in education in the rural area. On the other hand, Chinese government still set some limits, what in China we call the hukou system, the limits that restrict uh, to some degree for people to permanently live in the big cities in the in the big cities and uh, that makes the um, population from the rural area less um, less intended to to invest in education because only if you have the long term you know um, pros prospect of living in one city then you want to invest in education in that for in that area and on the, on the other hand since p most people are still in rural area the government uh, still needs more money needs more money to invest in the area so this is a big issue in china and another thing is that uh, the um, because the, the number of universities still carries out from the old plant economy system. So most of the universities in China is still limited and controlled by, um, monitored by the government. So in order to enhance education to the skilled labor, I think this is very important for, f for future development of the Chinese economy, of upgrading of the exports. There's more potential for the collaboration of the education that, uh, that could be brought up, up brought about by the Western, for Europe, from Russia. And uh, you can see the number that more and more people now in China, students are studying in the UK, in the US, in, even in Russia. So this is a, um, quite a potential to increase China's skilled labor. And uh, to um, I think this could finally solve the gap between that the China and Russia. But in the short term, the two countries both have their comparative advantage in their specific uh, term uh, products of exports. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further comments or questions? If not, I, I think that we um, saved a few minutes. Um, um, let me say a few words on, on behalf, uh, my behalf. Um, I must say that um, despite my long involvement co cross-country comparative research, I still presentation of Laura was was uh, 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 very refreshing my knowledge and in some way surprising. I mean, especially uh, findings of um, similarity of economic structure on FDI and on uh, uh, in, uh, intra-regional. Uh, differences. Um, maybe one comment from my side. I, I think that um, still we didn't get to uh, detailed structure of export and import. And I think that this, uh, the, uh, as far as I understand this agenda of the next sessions, um, uh, I think that this is exactly the factor which uh, uh, explains um, different role played by WTO and WTO accession in both countries. In case of Russia, where the dominant export items, uh, energy resources and commodities, uh, this uh, early WTO membership was not so important, so critical for, for further integration with the world economy, while in case of China, China who is uh, the largest manufacturing exporter in the world, this was a very, very, very important factor for which uh, open possibility of, of further economic expansion. Saying that, I, I would like to pass the role of chair to uh, Alicia to, to, to follow up with chairing the next session. Thank you very much. The issues that we've not covered yet, but always uh, on the topic of Russia, China, and the impact on Europe. And we'll move slowly into the impact on Europe on the third session, though. So I'd like to introduce uh, Heli Simola from uh, Buffett as well, and, um, and then Eric Gigardin as our discussant from Ex-Marseille School of Economics. 
So uh, I guess I just give you the floor with your presentation. Thank you. Um, and first of all, uh, of course, I would like to thank Bruegel very much for organizing this very topical event and uh, giving me the opportunity to share some of my views on, on the topic with, with all of you. Uh, my presentation uh, will basically have, have three parts. Uh, in the first part, I will briefly review uh, the recent history of, of the economic relations between Russia and China uh, in the past couple of uh, decades, and uh, then looking at the situation uh, with the interdependence uh, between the countries. In the next part, I will move on to look a bit more in detail uh, in the recent developments in the economic relations and to see if uh, the latest events have, have had an impact on, on, on the relations. And uh, for the end, I will try to briefly assess uh, the perspectives in the near term uh, for the continuation of, of the cooperation. My presentation is largely based on analysis of very, several various uh, statistical indica indicators, as well as then on, on some uh, recent analysis written by uh, both Russian and uh, Chinese and uh, other international uh, scholars. But uh, first, uh, okay, let's start from the general level. So, I mean, overall, if we think about the economic relations between, uh, between Russia and China, uh, it would seem uh, at first that they, the countries actually have a huge potential for, for uh, bilateral economic cooperation. And some of the issues were mentioned already in, in the uh, first session. I mean, both uh, economies are among the largest in the world. They are located uh, as, as neighbors to each other. And uh, in, to, to a large extent, the production structures or, uh, in the countries are, are complementary. The examples mentioned already, for example, the energy with China being the importer, uh, Russia exporter, as well as the labor force uh, uh, with uh, Russia having a high educated labor force and China uh, at the moment less, uh, less high educated lab labor force. But um, despite this uh, potential, uh, for a long time, economic relations between these uh, countries have actually been even surprisingly narrow. And uh, there has been certainly uh, a lot of high-level dialogue and many projects, like, for example, the Year of China in Russia and Year of Russia in China, uh, that depicted in, in, in the picture, uh, that have been uh, put on uh, to forward the cooperation. But so far, uh, the relations have actually been even surprisingly narrow, despite the potential. But uh, if we look more closely on, on the development in the past couple of decades, okay, and now it's getting... Uh, I think the trade development actually uh, gives uh, quite a good picture on the overall development, as that's certainly the main element uh, in the economic relations between countries, uh, and uh, it shows uh, the trends quite clearly. Uh, in both of these uh, trade pictures, we are actually uh, looking at value-added trade. That was also, uh, to some extent, already mentioned, uh, that especially from the part of China, which is a uh, closely related part of uh, international supply chains, it is important to make the difference between the trade and value added. Uh, so that is uh, actually the part that is uh, produced in China. So in here, we are looking at this kind of trade. And obviously, this applies also to Russia. But uh, uh, from the Russian point of view, the question is not uh, so important because uh, in Russian exports, uh, the domestic value added is high anyway because it's it's so much concentrated on uh, on the uh, mining and quarrying side. But if we start uh, 
we can see that uh, the kind of uh, re uh, warming of the relations between countries uh, started in, in the middle of 1990s, uh, after cooler periods before that. And uh, the cooperation uh, started to uh, increase gradually. Of course, in the first uh, period, the, there were problems caused by the economic crisis in Asia and Russia, which were restricting uh, the increase uh, of the economic relations. But then from, from the year 2000 on, uh, there was certainly a pickup in, in the trade relations. And especially since 2005, the development has been uh, very uh, rapid and the trade has, has been growing strongly. Then if we move on uh, to the right-hand side picture, uh, there we have the structure of uh, bilateral value-added trade. Uh, and as we can see from the picture, there are actually some uh, changes and some kind of opposite changes been happening during, during the past couple of decades. If we start from the Chinese part, which is on the left on, on the figure, we can see that the share of primary sector and uh, lower tech products, which here are exemplified by, by food industry and agriculture, uh, their share has actually declined quite a lot uh, and been replaced by uh, higher tech products like machinery and equipment. And uh, this is indeed the value added that is produced in China and uh, exported ten, then to Russia. So it doesn't just uh, depict the, uh, uh, the production that has ha low value added in China. Whereas on the Russian uh, side, the development has been actually quite the opposite. Uh, the share of primary sector has increased notably uh, in the form of mining and quarrying products, of course partly due to price developments, uh, but anyhow, and uh, the share of machinery and equipment has really dec decreased uh, uh, very significantly in the Russian exports to China. Uh, with the trade between countries increasing, uh, obviously also uh, the bilateral dependency between the countries uh, has been increasing, but actually it remains still quite low. Uh, in the pictures we have the supply dependency and, and the demand dependency, so which can, can be thought of as, as import and export dependencies. And uh, of course the dependency should not be uh, interpreted as kind of literal thing, but I mean just depicting uh, uh, the strengthness of the economic relations between the countries. Um, and the, both, both pictures also, also show that actually both countries are more of oriented towards other markets. Uh, with, uh, in Chinese trade, uh, the East and Southeast Asia having the most important role and uh, in, in Russia's trade, it's the EU that, uh, uh, that has been playing the largest role. And the third point that we can see from these pictures is that instead of uh, interdependency, uh, the situation could be more characterized by uh, rather one-sided dependency uh, with the share of China in Russian trade being a much higher than uh, than share of Russia in, in Chinese trade. And uh, this goes even if we take into account uh, the sizes of the economies, uh, the share of China is, is higher in, in Russian trade than, than in most other countries of, of comparable size. But uh, then if we move on to the recent development, uh, there has certainly been an impression that the relations have started to bloom in, in the past couple of years, and uh, many have uh, uh, combined this with uh, Russia's uh, relations tensioning with the West, and then Russia, for example, brought more vigorously up the statement of, of pivoting to Asia. Asia. Uh, I guess there are a bit two sides in this. On one hand, uh, this pivot to Asia was uh, brought up already earlier. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in that sense, it's, it's not a new idea. But on the other hand, I guess uh, 
many uh, experts assessing the developments, uh, do you see that uh, uh, Russia has uh, made more more active concessions in in the negotiations in order to receive this kind of uh, new steps in in cooperation, uh, for which I guess among the most often mentioned are the natural gas agreements, as, as already brought up. Uh, then in, in the arms trade, also this important contract, as well as then uh, the regional cooperation uh, between the Eurasian Economic Union and, and the Chinese uh, initiative of Silk Road Economic Belt. But uh, so there has been certainly a lot of attention uh, on these uh, high level uh, agreements. But uh, then if we move on to this kind of more general level from, from this uh, uh, individual uh, big scale deals, the development seems to have been uh, more moderate and uh, hampered uh, by the economic problems uh, experienced by, by the Russian economy. So, for example, if we look at the development of Russian imports, uh, as in, in the left-hand side picture, we can see that the imports have been contracting substantially during the past couple of years, and the contraction uh, is really concerning uh, all uh, geographical regions, uh, including uh, also China. So the economic troubles have, have influenced the relations also here. Uh, and also the development has uh, been similar as before, also in the sense of, uh, of the bilateral dependency, uh, as it seems that China's share in Russian trade has increased, whereas uh, Russia's share in, in Chinese trade has actually even slightly declined in, in the past couple of years. So not too big changes in, in that development. Um, if we move on to, to the investment flows, uh, there seems to have neither been very uh, substantial changes. Uh, of course, it should be noted that uh, with the foreign direct investment statistics, uh, you have a lot of uncertainties and uh, uh, it is not very easy to make conclusions from there, um, especially on, on bilateral level. But anyhow, uh, the picture that emerges uh, quite clearly is that even using any, any figures is uh, that uh, Russia and China are not among each other's most important investment partners. Uh, the flows have been quite small in past years uh, and uh, there have, has been uh, a decrease in, in, in the latest years. And also the stocks uh, uh, seem to be quite uh, moderate in, in both sides, especially uh, relative uh, to the total, total stock. Also, in the credit markets, uh, there might not have been uh, as uh, significant changes as uh, may be hoped, so that in general, uh, there seems to be no notable increase in, in crediting from China to Russia, except some individual deals. And, uh, this uh, has been assessed by experts to be due to uh, these sanctions to some extent uh, having an influence also here, although not directly, and some difficulties on, on agreeing on the price. Then looking uh, some more detailed sectors. Okay. We should have oil here, and now we actually have it, yes. So uh, if we look at oil trade, there the development has been a bit different. Uh, volume of oil exports from Russia to China has grown, and uh, notably also in, in the past couple of years. Uh, in oil trade, an important uh, push has been caused by the transport infrastructure development. Uh, when uh, the oil pipeline the, from East Siberia to Pacific Ocean was completed, uh, that certainly boosted a lot the potential of uh, oil exports to China, especially as there was also the branch from the pipe uh, directly to China. 
and uh, this can be seen in in the level increase in 2011. So for this pipeline to be completed, uh, it was uh, obviously more easier because it was not relying only on Chinese demand, but uh, it was leading to, to the Far Eastern ports where it, it could uh, supply several markets and has also, uh, also done that. And uh, in support for this uh, was also provided uh, finance from, from China uh, in order to complete the pipeline. And uh, this similar development continued in 2013. There was another important uh, oil contract uh, and the uh, East Siberia Pacific Ocean pipeline uh, was uh, upgraded, uh, which made it possible to have this uh, uh, level increases in, in the oil exports. There are also plans for extending the Chinese branch of the pipeline, which would then uh, allow a further increase in, in the oil trade. And uh, as we can see from the right-hand side, uh, in the oil trade side, uh, there is actually uh, interdependence in a sense that both countries have become among each other's most important trading partners in, in oil. Uh, with a with an important shares uh, for both countries. Um, if we then move on to natural gas, uh, there was certainly uh, a lot of attention given to these uh, natural gas agreements that were signed, and uh, it is certain they are certainly an important step forward but uh, there remains uh, still much work to be done. If we start from, uh, from the more important one, uh, which was the first one, so that uh, the countries agreed that Russia would supply uh, natural gas from uh, Eastern Siberia uh, across this new pipeline to be constructed uh, to China. Uh, this was the huge deal that was uh, negotiated for, for a decade. Um, and then the agreement was reached, uh, but as uh, Laura mentioned, obviously uh, the field is still, at the moment, not yet in operation. And uh, uh, if we think about the pipeline, uh, it has been, recorded that uh, about 100 kilometers have been built so far, so there is uh, still uh, uh, a lot of uh, building to do there. <coughs> um, whereas regarding uh, the other agreement on, on the gas from Western uh, Siberia to, uh, to China with, the, with the, another uh, pipeline, there uh, are still many things to be negotiated, like, like the price. But uh, obviously, if uh, these uh, uh, agreements will go forward as uh, according to the plans at some point, this will uh, then increase the trade uh, in natural gas uh, with, between the countries uh, uh, significantly. And then China could uh, uh, be ab about, 30% of Russian exports, with the rest still going uh, going to European countries, and uh, Russia could be an, in gas pro as a gas provider for China about as important as, for example, Turkmenistan. Um, but uh, beyond the pipelines, it should be noted that uh, one project in the gas sector that has been moving on quite swiftly. Is, uh, is the LNG project uh, in, uh, in the Yamal Peninsula, uh, where, there are, where the Chinese companies and, and the development fund are having stakes, and uh, it has also received Chinese funding. So that project seems to be uh, uh, moving forward all the time. Um, getting back to uh, the other, uh, things that received a lot of uh, attention. Uh, one of them was this contract on, on arms. And if we look at the arms trade, uh, there the development has been very different uh, uh, different than in other areas. 
Uh, obviously, it is not so easy to get any uh, exact figures on that, but uh, we rely here on the on the statistics provided uh, by CIPRI. And as you can see from from the figure, uh, arms trade has been actually declining during the past decade, unlike other trade, and the levels have been um, much lower in in past years than earlier. And uh, the situation is also very different in the sense that uh, here uh, Russian share in Chinese imports is quite high, whereas uh, uh, China's share in, in Russian exports is, is much lower, uh, and it's not the main market for, for Russian arms exports anymore. Obviously, uh, the recent contract doesn't show here yet, uh, with some uh, information there is. It is supposed to be uh, realized perhaps in 2017. So if that will be the case, then it certainly will, will show up in these figures and uh, also be an uh, important change in, in qualitative terms. And still, uh, for, for the regional uh, cooperation, um, there obviously uh, in the region, both countries have priority, their own priority projects. For Russia, it is the Eurasian Economic Union project, uh, the regional integration project, whereas for, for China is uh, the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, uh, which uh, uh, overlaps to some extent with the Russian project, especially in, in the area of uh, Central Asia. And uh, although uh, it was assessed by many experts at the, that uh, in, in the beginning when the One Belt, One Road initiative was, uh, was published, uh, Russians were somewhat cautious about its implications. Uh, last year, it seems that the countries uh, found uh, a common way um, and, uh, are, and stated to uh, strive for uh, co cooperating in coordinating the, the projects. Uh, in practice, it is not so clear what this would mean. Uh, obviously, it, it is uh, to a large part due to that, that the projects are very different in, in nature. Uh, the Chinese Belt and, uh, the One Belt and uh, One Road Initiative is uh, more like a framework uh, for uh, for developing uh, trade and uh, uh, increasing trade in, in the area. Uh, and there are no detailed or specific plans, at least at the moment. Whereas the Russian project of Eurasian Union, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, is, is uh, certainly has uh, a lot of detailed plans and frameworks and uh, uh, guidelines how to pro uh, proceed with the regional integration. Uh, and uh, also the Eurasian Economic uh, Union seems to be more, uh, more toward uh, increasing internal cooperation in the area, uh, which uh, uh, is a bit uh, different uh, emphasis than, than in the One Belt, One Road initiative. So, that will have to be seen in how this uh, sphere develops, and maybe we will we'll hear, hear more about this uh, at the end of this week, uh, then when, when there's the next meeting. But then if we still look a bit for the uh, perspectives in the near term, uh, the perspectives for economic cooperation uh, depend also on political considerations, uh, and this has lar largely to do uh, to the thing that, I mean, uh, the best potential for further increasing cooperation uh, is in the fields of energy, raw materials, as well as infrastructure, uh, which are politi politically quite sensitive areas, and uh, there are also a lot of uh, state-owned companies dominating these areas. And obviously this is the case also in many other countries than, than Russia and China, but uh, also there. 
So maybe in these kind of areas, uh, uh, it is not so much of an aim to increase interdependency, but uh, uh, but more uh, to increase uh, uh, decrease dependency on on any any countries. And obviously, there are uh, common interests uh, there in in the fields of energy uh, and infrastructure. Uh, in the sense of Russia certainly wants to develop its uh, production and uh, its infrastructure, uh, but then uh, it's not so willing to give up on on selling uh, big parts of, of the companies, maybe. And on the Chinese part, obviously, there are also uh, interests for diversing raw material supply and, and finding new markets for, for domestic production. Uh, um, but then it might require uh, a, a significant presence in the markets. And uh, the question is, uh, can there be found a balanced approach between uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, in uh, things that, that, that uh, parties are interested in? But uh, beyond these large-scale uh, projects, uh, I think in the near term there is uh, more limited potential for increased cooperation. Uh, if we think about the traditional attractions that uh, Chinese markets uh, have offered for uh, international investors, uh, it seems that at least at the moment um, they offer less possibilities for Russian companies. Uh, if we look at the international comparisons uh, and uh, research uh, in most other products than energy and raw materials, uh, Russian goods are not very competitive internationally, and that uh, goes especially for consumer products. And uh, another thing that has uh, attracted many foreign companies to Chinese markets uh, are the affordable production costs. But uh, with the recent decline in the economy and uh, the strong uh, depreciation of the ruble, uh, China actually appears not to be uh, a market of cheap labor, uh, at least for Russian companies, as average wage appears to be actually even higher in China than in Russia at the moment. Then uh, in the Russian market, there is certainly interest for uh, the Chinese companies are cer certainly interested in, in the Russian markets, but uh, uh, as any other as any foreign investment, also Chinese investment is is hampered by problems in in the business environment. And uh, then, if we think about increasing exports, uh, that might be restricted by the. Uh, protectionist policies, uh, which aim at reducing import dependency and uh, promoting uh, import substitution in in Russia. Uh, but for the conclusion, uh, I would say that the bilateral interdependency between the countries uh, has certainly increased, but remains quite low, and is. Uh, rather one-sided uh, than an actual in interdependency. And uh, obviously, uh, the recent blooming of, of relations has led to some important steps forward, uh, also in economic relations, and uh, has resulted in some uh, large-scale deals. But if you look at the wider uh, development in, in practice, at least so far, uh, there the development is is more moderate. And uh, uh, in the near term, uh, the development of economic relations uh, seems to be uh, depending a lot on on the advances in these big scale projects, as uh, the wider relations are hampered by many. Uh, structural problems, uh, solving of which will certainly take some time. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Heli. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. I think there is no doubt why we are organizing this seminar with Buffett. It's great knowledge about 
China and Russia. Before I give the floor to Eric, though, I wanted to add a little bit on, because there was a question on AIIB and the Belt and Road and how big Russia is for this project. And I was just trying to find some figures on previous work. And uh, we actually came up with a calculation of all of the investments that China has already embarked on for the Belt and Road project and how they are distributed across countries. And it so happens that Russia is the largest recipient already, followed by Pakistan. So the numbers I have here is about 70 billion disbursed already, US dollar, out of which 80% is in energy. And, and uh, the remaining is rail, the, one of these very massive uh, rail constructions yeah, that uh, China is embarking on. So that's one thing I wanted to share with you. And on top of that, more recent data, which is basically what is being discussed now, is already a high spill uh, project, uh, about 800 million, which apparently has been already approved by the BRICS Bank. Uh, AIB has kind of stepped uh, down a little bit on this and wait and on a wait and see uh, mode for the Moscow Kazan uh, high spill rail, uh, railway. So that's one. And uh, more recently, even, there's been a request by the Far Eastern uh, Development Fund for China to actually invest as much as eight to nine billion US dollar in. 20 projects that the fund has identified in the Russian space for China to invest in beyond AIB, literally, you know, through other means, out of which the fund itself is willing to finance about 10%. So I, I bring this to the table because it does, it does confirm in a way to me your final conclusion, which is very interesting of this, this uh, unbalanced uh, relationship. Increasingly so. Uh, now, you know, the, the, the Far Eastern Development Fund is willing to finance only 10% of the whole bill while asking Russia to do the rest. And I think this is increasingly the trend. Uh, so in other words, more simply, China, uh, Russia becoming more and more dependent on, on China. That's my reading of, of these figures. Um, but I, I leave it there. I just wanted to share with you this information. And I leave the floor to Eric. For comments on the paper. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, also, Alicia, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I also am very happy to be here to discuss a paper uh, done at Buffett, uh, which I visited many times and hope to visit again in the future. Um, so, this is a very interesting and informative paper, uh, which uh, provides uh, very original data. It's uh, refreshing to see uh, the care taken to distinguish the gross trade flows and the value added flows. Well, unfortunately, because of lack of time, you did not spend too much time on this distinction, but, uh, and you rather focused on the value added side, which is certainly much more informative, but uh, of course the gross flows uh, maybe give a distorted picture and you were careful to uh, warn us against using this data of gross flows, which is unfortunately most often used. Uh, as I will also caution people in the use of Chinese data, I think this is very, very important. Uh, and also um, the other data more recent that you were able to present on uh, investment and other uh, forms of interdependence were very informative. Um, well, however, the message is really that it is rising but starting from a low base. So in some way, it, uh, it leads to low expectations. Uh, are they really interdependent? You would rather say, well, not that much, and if at all, one way, uh, if I may summarize this, because um, even if things have been moving in the recent time. So uh, what I'll be doing here is, well, trying to. Uh, I'll be reflecting a little bit on this notion of interdependence. Sorry for the typo. Uh, and then mainly I'll be focusing on um, trying to look more. You've been looking at the channels, 
I will look a little bit at the effects. Uh, so what are, given that you do not expect much, do I find much or do I find little? Um, well, it's on its way. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I refer to some literature which is a little bit outside economics, but can be useful because it actually clarifies uh, the distinction between these two forms of vertical versus horizontal independence. I refer to a paper with many, many co-authors, so I only put the first one, uh, which is a little old, but I think it's quite interesting because you are focusing on what they call vertical. Uh, but of course, maybe at some stage, I don't know if you have uh, aims at doing that, uh, looking a little more at what we would call maybe uh, in finance integration, financial integration and things like this. So uh, this might be complementary uh, to that and maybe our usual tools, given what uh, Alicia just said, uh, may not be that uh, appropriate to look at these forms of interdependence. Uh, and also, I think there is an awful lot of literature, I'll give you references, on uh, what uh, people in political science call uh, strategic interdependence. Um, so maybe there would be things to, I mean, to what extent um, this becomes crucial for the functioning of the economy. Could you live without it uh, or not? And I suppose that given the geostrategic uh, elements in all this, this might be important to look at. Um, oh, the typo seems to be very persistent. Sorry for that. Uh, so now, okay, ah, too much of a good thing. Uh, so now, basically, uh, what Heli has been focusing on is really the trade, which is a middle in this uh, chart. And what I'll be trying to look at is the two sides, uh, chi China's output and Russia's output. And unfortunately, uh, even though the data you've used is very nice, uh, it's very low frequency. So there is imp it's impossible to do any time series work on this. Uh, so I've, work, I've done some work intensively, and actually with the help of uh, Buffett support at some stage, uh, on uh, measuring properly China's output. Uh, so I thought it might be a good idea to <coughs> try and link that to Russia's output uh, and to see whether there is any effect, because we don't expect much, so is there something uh, in the China to Russia direction uh, and well, possibly some feedbacks. Uh, you don't expect any. Well, so we will see. Uh, right. So, of course, this is a reduced form analysis. We do not at all look at transmission channels, uh, which you can discuss, but there is some literature saying that actually maybe this is what you should do. Okay. So, what's important here is that the uh, output uh, measure we are using for Russia includes Fortunately, all this energy mining querying, uh, so it's uh, really important. Uh, the difficulty comes on the Chinese side. What is China's industrial output? Well, that's a big question. Uh, the, uh, we've been doing uh, intensive work with Harry Wu uh, at Ito Tsubashi University in Japan on this question. Uh, and basically, the official Chinese output data is completely misleading uh, for two reasons. The first one is purely statistical. If you can want to understand the intuition, it's very simple. Uh, basically, they underestimate inflation, so as they overestimate real growth. But there are more, or more sophisticated elements, but this is the main one. Uh, on the institutional level, you have to be very, very careful uh, because there is a sophisticated game among provincial and uh, lower tier uh, jurisdiction uh, leaders, uh, but this game is not always one-sided. People have the impression that in a systematic way, the Chinese growth number would be over-reported. This is obsolete. This view was true in the 80s and, 90, 80s and 90s. It was not true in the first decade of the new millennium. Our data rather sometimes says the opposite. In the new millennium, basically what they did, they smoothed out the data. So little effect of global financial crisis. And before that, they underestimated 
the growth boosting effect of WTO. Uh, so what Harry Wu is doing, and he's been doing that for three decades, is reconstructing uh, output bottom up from starting from commodities uh, using input output tables, but domestics, these ones, uh, and uh, uh, trying to find out uh, what is some sort of genuine measure of output. Uh, the new thing here is that I managed to convince him last summer, where we were sitting in Aix-en-Provence, it was very hot, so I told him, well, why don't you get inside and spend some time constructing monthly data? Uh, so this is what he did for the first time. He had been always uh, building yearly data. Uh, so I've been using this uh, series. Uh, OK, sorry for this. Aha, uh -huh. well, it's coming. OK, so this is a correlation between the growth in China's industrial output and either of the two uh, Chinese industrial output measures. Uh, so you have the official one in the first column and our commodities-based uh, one in the second. Uh, so I've put the full sample uh, that we have from 2000 to 2015. We have not yet updated the series. It's going to come later this month, so I hope we will do that. Um, so basically, the message is in the second and uh, third rows. Uh, you see that, well, basically, I didn't compute here the statistical significance of these things, but on usual standards uh, in the 2000 to 2008, this is not significant. So you can basically conclude that there is no uh, significant correlation between the two uh, output growth measures, even if you take into account lags, which may be important if you think about it. Um, uh, now, of course, you see that the picture changed in the post-GFC period, uh, but you have this strange negative uh, time T effect uh, between these two with the official data. Well, I told you that this official data is completely unreliable, so you don't expect much. Uh, if you sum the uh, zero and uh, first lag, you see that these two sum to almost very little. So basically, we conclude that maybe this uh, official data does not correlate with Russia's output data, which in some ways is a little surprising. So it may be yet another proof that this China's official data is useless. Um, so now, and well, rather than useless, maybe misleading. Uh, the uh, commodities data tells a very different picture, because if you add up these two numbers, starts to be very substantial, 0.45 or something like this. Uh, so really, this is rather surprising, given Haley's low expectations. Uh, of course, we have to be careful, because correlations are only uh, so part of the uh, information. So uh, I tried to do more formal uh, statistical relationships, but of course, these are uh, very uh, preliminary. Uh, well, basically, if you take the official industrial output data from China, there is no long-run relationship with Russia's output, uh, neither before the global financial crisis nor after. So it has no long-run relationship whatsoever. And um, it has no short-run relationship either, no dynamic relationship. Now, the surprise is that there is a long-run relationship between China's uh, reconstructed output data and Russia's output data, but uh, after the global financial crisis. So this is a sort of new phenomenon starting in 2009. And to, our, to my surprise, and I suppose to Haley's surprise, there is some feedback. Uh, and of course, the next table will show you the details, but I wanted to uh, first summarize uh, the main uh, results. So that's the table. Uh, so very surprisingly, this long, -run relation, this long run coefficient is exactly what we found with a simple correlation. So maybe actually, why do you need sophisticated tools if the simple ones give you the same story? 
0.44 was exactly the sum of these two lags that we saw before, which is a little bit surprising because it refers to something quite different. Uh, now, there is no short run relationship, so the dynamics, nothing to be seen. Uh, now, the error correction, to what extent uh, do you take into account this long run relationship in short run effects? You see that it, it is much more sizable in the China to Russia side than on the Russia to China side, but it, it's still there. So uh, there is already something uh, very, very surprising. Uh, it's there, it's small, but well, as you said, it may grow. Uh, okay, so we can conclude that uh, contrary possibly to our expectations, uh, this trade channel seems to have translated into significant uh, output effects both ways. Uh, of course, well, the problem is uh, currency developments were mentioned uh, by previous speakers. Uh, we would like to know to what extent they are affecting these trade flows. Uh, well, of course, if everything is invoiced in dollars, this is not going to make any difference to anybody. However, we know that the Chinese want to invoice their imports in RMBs. To what extent do they pay uh, the Russians in RMBs. I would be very interested to know that. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Well, uh, it was really very interesting. Uh, before I pass on the uh, floor to questions and, and comments, uh, from Heli, uh, on the last point, I think it's, it's, it's really quite crucial because it's in a way related to two issues. I mean, the fact that Russia is indeed a major uh, trade settler, if you want, renminbi, as much as, by the way, Africa. Uh, you know, the more so, the more you move into the emerging world. And um, this explains, for example, in in uh, European statistics that France is the second largest uh, country in Europe after the UK in renminbi, in trade settling renminbi. And the reason is not France, uh, but actually Africa settling uh, renminbi payments from uh, uh, actually uh, France. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, Bank of China in in Paris. So, so I think this is uh, quite appealing, in a way, an additional reason for this interest uh, for China to trade with uh, countries which would accept, uh, you know, its own currency for settlement. So I think that's a very you know different topic that we may want to to open. Um, in this section or in the next section, uh, for us to consider. But indeed, it is. It is, I think, one of the major uh, reasons for the Belt and Road project, and you know, and indeed, Russia-China relations, among others. So, uh, on on that note, I open the floor for questions and comments uh, for Heli or even Eric. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, um, I have a couple of uh, comments or questions, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me from your conclusions that uh, the economic and trade relationship between Russia and China is a typical relationship between uh, uh, colonial, uh, colonial uh, uh, at the time of colonial times, if you like. China is importing raw materials and energy products from Russia and is exporting manufactured goods uh, to Russia. Um, do you see, I mean, uh, uh, do you see a change in this kind of uh, pattern which uh, dates back to the 19th century? Uh, it looks like uh, a European uh, relationship, a trade relationship with the GCC or with Africa. I mean, uh, we are uh, importing oil and we are exporting manufactured goods. Uh, I, uh, can, can you tell me uh, at least looking at uh, uh, your analysis and looking at uh, the future, can you tell me at least uh, two or three manufactured goods made in Russia which may have a chance to be exported uh, to China in the next 10, 15 years? 
drawing uh, or uh, leading to leading to uh, a Russian development, a Russian development, or leading to uh, a Chinese modern or useful for the Chinese modernization. Uh, I mean, I, do you have uh, do you have in mind uh, two or three uh, com items, manufactured goods, which may may be ex exported successfully from Russia to China in the next ten or fifteen years? This is the first, first question. The second question is the following: China, over the last twenty years, let's say even fifteen years, has been able to develop uh, gigantic multinational corporations, which have uh, literally conquered the world. Lenovo, Huawei, uh, you mentioned them, many of them. Do you see any possibility for Russia to uh, adopt a kind of uh, growth or development model which may lead Russia to have uh, one or two or three big multinational corporations in the next uh, 10, 15 years, following more or less the Chinese example? And then uh, uh, my last question is the following. Uh, China is interested to export, uh, to produce in the Western markets. Uh, they are planning to invest in uh, Poland, they are planning to invest in Romania, they plan to invest in, in, even in Holland, etc., etc. Do you think that they may consider uh, making investments in Russia, creating new uh, enterprises or new manufacturing uh, sites in Russia? not necessarily for the Russian market, but also for the Western market, to re-export goods to the Western market. And do you think that in this uh, uh, trend, in this uh, framework, do you think that uh, the um, uh, Hong Kong investment through China may go to Russia for uh, products due to be sold in, in Western Europe or even in North America? Do you think that the Taiwanese investment to China may be transferred to Russia in order to produce items for Western market and for North America in a, in a kind of a global supply chain? Do you think that there are possibilities <coughs> for Russia to play the role of, uh, let's say, a transit manufacturing site for products which are supposed to be sold outside Russia to other markets? Thank you. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, sorry, maybe start on. Me? Yes, please. Marek Dombrowski, I have two questions. Uh, one is to Eric. Um, if I catch correctly your, your analysis um, and result about this long term uh, relationship uh, going from. from Chinese to Russian uh, output. Um, is it perhaps uh, another story that, that both are determined by the same exogenous factor, like, for example, US monetary policy? Uh, yeah, the, uh, and another question is about the size of, of trade between uh, Russia and China which looks that in spite of growing, it's still many, many people think that it's not getting to potential. And my question is exactly about potential. Um, if we think about trade gravity model, perhaps this can explain the, 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 the size intensity of this trade relation because despite of be, being neighbors and having the long land border, actually the gravity centers of both economies are quite distant from one to a, and other, and, and also given not very dense transportation network between both countries. So perhaps uh, this is exactly what, what can come out from this kind of analysis. And my question is whether you try to do this kind of, of analysis. It's a question to both, to both speakers. Yep. Uh, sorry, first, yeah. <coughs> yeah. My question ah, yes. maybe Thank could you. be regarded as an additional one, as an addition to the first question of the first gentleman. So in Russian media about uh, maybe 
uh, half a month or one month ago, there were some information, some reports that China is um, considering uh, about moving some its enterprises uh, to the territory of Russia, Siberia, and the Far East. Uh, so I, I believe it could be regarded as a normal process uh, for any country which is developing very fast. Uh, there is a, there should uh, start a period when this country is moving its enterprises, its production, um, to, to other countries. So uh, is it uh, actually... Uh, we, I can't uh, estimate uh, uh, the situation right now. Maybe it's just only uh, there are only some plans of that, or maybe there are some negotiations. But my question is about what do you think uh, uh, when uh, uh, there will uh, when China uh, come to this moment when it will become exporting its production forces or its enterprises to Russia. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder, we are now discuss discussing here in Europe the market economy uh, status of China. Russia has somewhat a similar background. I don't want to go into socialism, communism, and all that. How far these two economies, which apparently were already somewhat politically competing in the 1960s, 1970s, opening up afterwards, are now comparable. In WTO, uh, Russia is recognized as a market economy. China, so far, is not recognized, at least by the EU as such. How do the experts here see a comparison of market economy in Russia and China? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, soon from Chinese mission to the EU, I just only have uh, the, uh, uh, three brief comments. The first, uh, the uh, interdependence between China and Russia. I do believe that this interdependence is uh, uh, increasing fastly and with a very uh, stable prospect in the future. Uh, uh, let me uh, just give, uh, give example in the energy uh, sector, for example, the, the natural gas. China need uh, a lot of natural gas from all over the world. Uh, in 2014, our uh, uh, the consumption of natural gas is uh, 184 uh, uh, BCM, and uh, it's estimated by 2020 we need uh, uh, 360 uh, BCM. So uh, even if all the contracts with Russia on natural gas has been uh, realized is still uh, not enough for us. So, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, uh, I I think that uh, in this uh, energy sector we have a uh, uh, great potential between China and Russia, and we are also very dependent on Russia on natural gas. Mm -hmm. And the second that is uh, statistic, the the authentics of the uh, China uh, economic statistics. Statistics. I read about some uh, reports and also some uh, policy uh, of some uh, discussion papers that question the the, uh, the authentic of the China's uh, economic statistics. I take this as a, as a, how to say the academic uh, discussion uh, because I don't think it's uh, uh, it's accepted by the, the mainstream. Uh, uh, academic world also is not accepted by the the government and the international organizations. Uh, so, and the last uh, remarks on the, I I I have a, a different opinion with uh, um, uh, with a, a scholar from the EIAS on this uh, uh, not suitable comparison uh, between China Russia and Russia. Uh, uh, Trade uh, relations with the 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 the, the, EU, uh, the Europe, uh, the relations between U Europe and uh, Africa in the col uh, colonial period, I think is our uh, cooperation is mutual beneficial. Is an uh, we are equal partners. I think we don't because we are we are the uh, how say the uh, suffered from the uh, also the uh, colonial uh, uh, aggression. 
So we don't have this, uh, this kind of uh, thinking, a way of thinking. Uh, I think maybe the, you have, some of you have this uh, rich uh, background, cultural background, so it's uh, very natural to have this uh, linkage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions? Yeah, don't worry. I have two questions, one for Haley, and uh, you mentioned the, the business environment uh, in Russia, and um, I heard from many entrepreneurs in China that uh, telling me that uh, operating business in, Ch in Russia is very difficult, more difficult than in the EU economies uh, because of the some cultural conflict uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, because um, operating some sales, uh, not so protected in Russia. Can you elaborate more on this issue? And another thing is, uh, in addition on the, to the China statistics, I know there are some, um, even some academic journals, very famous journal paper published uh, in Journal of Public Economics by two professors from China, arguing that uh, the local leaders have the incentive to promote the GDP. But, and this is a, a quite a shock because the paper, is, I think, is published in 2005. But ever since, the many, many scholars have uh, retested the, the effect using the same data. And the, most of them cannot find the same, replicate their results. So people started to rethink the quality of the data. Another issue that may uh, make people, you know, if it's true that the local leaders have the incentive to promote economic growth, but uh, people should maybe bear in mind that this is not the only target in China. We have many, many targets, uh, unemployment, inflation, upgrading, structural transformation, and ever. Every, every a lot of things. Uh, even if you want, you know, make the data acceptable for uh, for to to get accepted and to get uh, promoted for those local officials, you need to bias it distort every data set. And in order to, to distort every data set, it's, uh, it's really really difficult because data are, are connected to each other. So that's uh, uh, one reason that uh, I agree that maybe there are some smooth of data in China's data set. But uh, for if, if we want to take a look at the long run effects of Chinese economic growth, I think it's still reliable. Okay, this is my addition to this uh, issue. Okay. Very, very short question, I'm Kuhn Adam from Belgium Foreign Ministry. I just want to refer to the, the news we, we learned, we read about <coughs> last 24 hours of the, the sale, the possible sale of 20% of Rosneft to China and India. I just uh, uh, would like to know the panel's opinion on what, in, the, in the context of this discussion this morning, what, what's behind that? Is this uh, part of a rapprochement in, in between both countries? That's one question. Or, or is it merely, uh, as it was represented in, in some papers, uh, uh, the cash need of uh, the Russian government uh, that is uh, pushing for, for this deal? And linked to that also, what, uh, because there India comes into the, the framework, what, uh, is is the relationship uh, Russia China uh, also to be looked at uh, in a triangular triangular uh, way in a BRICS way uh, with India involvement? So, any opinion on, on what's going on in that field would be uh, appreciated. Thank you. Some answers. Thank you. There were many, uh, many uh, good and topical questions, uh, although not always so easy to answer. But uh, I'll I'll try my best. Um, on the manufacturing exports of Russia, uh, the large picture is uh, that there are not many products that would be competitive in, in international markets. Obviously, there are some individual products uh, where uh, Russia is competitive in the nuclear sector, for example, uh, but uh, the amount of them seems to be quite limited. So we can see this in, in any export, exports of Russia to outside the CIS countries. It is mostly uh, energy, raw materials, and uh, very, uh, very little other, other products. Um, 
Um, then I guess a bit uh, related questions are, are the business environment and the uh, Chinese investment in Russia for, for producing for the European market. Uh, uh, that is certainly true that uh, in surveys made for Chinese companies, uh, they actually mention uh, as the one of the mo one of the most difficult barri barriers for investment to Russia, uh, the problems related to the business environment. They are not the only ones. Also, other foreign companies uh, have this kind of uh, perception in in the surveys, and uh, even the surveys made in Russia for Russian companies uh, are pointing to that the business environment uh, uh, has been getting poorer in, in the past couple of years. So uh, these kind of uh, problems uh, also uh, hamper the investment uh, from China to Russia in order to reach the European market. Uh, all, so uh, all these business environment problems, they uh, increase the costs uh, related to production in, in the Russian market, and, uh, and that w that's why uh, it also hampers investment there. Um, if we think about the uh, Russian development of, of the Russian uh, economy and, and manufacturing, uh, well, uh, there are the structural problems of the economy. I, I guess Laura can also uh, add, to, <laughs> add to this, but I mean, uh, there is uh, the strive for the diversification. I mean that is uh, mentioned as a as a goal for already for a longer longer time. Diversification, catering uh, the production from oil 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 and gas sector to manufacturing, uh, and uh, these kind of things uh, and problems they are known. But uh, at least so far, there seems that there is not much uh, proceeding in in getting these problems solved. Um, and then, um, uh, Marek's point on, on the gravity, I, I do agree totally on that. That is certainly true. Uh, uh, in the paper, I was looking also a bit more on the regional development, but she, uh, here I didn't present that. That is certainly true that the growth points in both countries in, are in different uh, places than, uh, than in the common border. Uh, the common border areas are more like in the periphery, although uh, targeted in, in the development plans. Um, then we had the, uh, the India thing. I mean, that, that is certainly a good point. Uh, I, I didn't mention that, that, for example, in, in the oil sector, uh, Chinese deeper involvement in like in the form of investment has been uh, smaller whereas for example the Indian ONG Videsh has stakes in in Sahalin 1 and uh, already acquired very <coughs> recently a share in in the Rosneft operated Vancor field so uh, this Indian company has been very very active and uh, this is obviously an, an interesting new new point here and there are also other uh, economic cooperation between Russia and India, for example, in, in the arms export side. So uh, this kind of triangular uh, development should, should certainly be taken into account. That, that is a good point. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I give the floor to Eric since there was a few questions. Uh, yeah, it seems there is a lot of interest in uh, the quality of uh, Chinese macro data. Uh, well, first, Marek, uh, well, the short answer is to say um, Chinese growth does not depend that much on U.S. monetary policy. Uh, it, on the period considered, it depended a lot on this huge ref fiscal reflation package, the largest ever. Uh, so I don't think that uh, USQE had such an effect. I mean, USQE did not have that much effect on the U.S. economy in the first place. So how could it have a locomotive effect abroad, except financially? Uh, but this is an interesting thing to test, and, of course, we should be careful to control for these things. Uh, now, on the quality of the data itself, well, yes, Mr. Sun is right. Uh, Mainstream academic uh, Western uh, 
uh, work uh, basically says, oh no, everything is fine with uh, Chinese macro data. Well, are we serious? Uh, and I, I have, uh, of course, regular problems with these guys, but do they mean what they say? I mean, the, the data I've shown, if there is really zero correlation while we find some with some other uh, serious output measures, it means something. So I think that definitely, and well, I could refer to the Li Kui Zhang index, and it seems the prime minister himself has some doubts on the official data. Uh, and I've heard that he seems to have on his desk Harry's numbers, so that may be telling enough. Now, of course, Mr. Su is right. Uh, in the recent period, in the 2000s, the incentive of local leaders changed completely for fiscal reasons. And the incentive now, or during that period, has been urbanization. Why is it that Chinese cities have become so big? Because the local leaders had the first incentive was to get above the table and maybe under the table revenues to uh, lease the land. Okay. The, the first we can measure, the, the other we cannot, but we can see it in, uh, in concrete. Uh, so I think that uh, I completely disagree with your last statement, which is that in the long run, the Chinese macro data is reliable. No, certainly not. And I give you one example only. Official industrial output data tells you that after WTO, industrial output growth fell in China compared to the 1980s and 90s. A little surprising, isn't it? That's all. OK, so perhaps, uh, yes, there's five minutes. I, I just wanted to maybe take a few of the questions that were not. So and I think a very interesting one, or uh, certainly very provoking, was to me uh, whether Russia will become uh, you know, a platform for manufacturing. Uh, with investment coming from China or elsewhere, uh, including China. And just to share with you a few thoughts or if, uh, some of the research we've conducted looking at Japan, because we, yes, this magical triangle we were discussing, India, Russia, China, I think we're forgetting Japan, which is really in this picture and, and, and very much so competing or trying to compete with, uh, you know, China's allure for all of this, Nine billion and at AIB bilaterally, uh, as we were speaking. So, so they are trying that also in Indonesia. It's out of the scope of the seminar, but I'm trying. They, they are trying. They're trying also with India. So, so I think it's, it, uh, these four countries. So, talking about manufacturing, um, what we see in JETRO uh, surveys um, for Japan outward FDI manufacturing FDI uh, is as follows: Nobody's going to Russia. To your, to your question. They are moving, indeed, away from China. So still, the bulk of uh, outward FDI, manufacturing outward FDI, which is the bulk of FDI anyway, from Japan into China, still the largest, but increasingly less every year. And moving from, J from China into uh, Vietnam, largest uh, uh, destination. And from Japan itself, into first Thailand, second Vietnam. Russia is nowhere to be found there. And I, I, it's very telling because, you know, uh, yes, maybe for Russian corporates into China that makes no sense, but for Japanese corporates into Russia, it could still make sense, and we're not seeing that. Uh, if, you know, the wages are higher already in China than in Russia. So, so they're rather going to Thailand. So I don't think that's going to, in my humble opinion, I don't think that's the trend we will see. And there are a number of reasons, such as ease of, uh, you know, in, uh, ease of uh, business, uh, et cetera, that we've discussed. And I think on another point that you made, which was very interesting to me also, this idea of largest corporate, China's humongous already corporations, yeah, uh, topping the Fortune 500 in, uh, to, to some extent, uh, where, is, where are the Russian ones? And, and uh, I thought about it and I said, yes. So I checked and I thought, oh, there's already five out of 500, which is, you know, given Russia's size, it's actually not so bad. The problem is they're all 
concentrated on one sector. <laughs> I think that's the, the problem. But, but if I was comparing it with Brazil, and they have one, uh, and probably, and probably, yeah, in the same sector, and probably no longer even, you know, who knows whether they will even survive this one. So, so this brings to me a, a very simple idea that that is literally uh, very hard to for anybody to emulate China. And then I think about the figures, and, and I finish there. But it, it's so, so it's as simple as this: China's economy in purchasing power parity today is 19 trillion US dollar. Russia is 3.5 trillion. So that already tells you why China has so many more, you know, corporate, it just, just the size. But most importantly, the contribution of Russia to global growth in the next 10 years, 2015 to 2025, is estimated to be below a, tr below a trillion by all means, below a trillion US dollars. So in particular, the figure I have here is 730 billion. China is 14.4 trillion. So, I mean, we're talking about, uh, uh, sorry, I mean, a, a, a humongous economy compared to Russia, and more so in the future. So, so this is why, in a way, because we're stuck with this idea that, you know, Russia, of course, is big, but China is humongous. So, so everything we say, in a way, if we base it, that, that was my point, by the size of the economy, is actually not so, but the only problem is that the, to me, I mean, the only, the main problem is the diversification. That's where I do see why Japan is not going to Russia. Because where? Where, where, where are the sectors? Why, why not go to Thailand? Why not go to Vietnam? There you have a growing manufacturing sector and a growing population. So, so I think maybe the comparison, and this is hard to hear, I understand. I mean, if I were Russian or even if as a, a European, unfortunately, it's hard to swallow. But that's the comparison, Thailand, Vietnam. I mean, this is the problem, our mindset. It's no longer Russia, China, because China is here. That's, that's, that's the reality in terms of both size, but certainly future size and not to talk about population. But so, so I think that's the problem, that we were somehow stuck with this idea of relative weight, but it, literally the, the change is so humongous. We're already in a different planet with China size today. So that explains a lot of the things we're seeing. So maybe it's not a colony, uh, you know, to your point, but because of China's humongous diversification compared to Russia, of course you end up in that situation. It's, it's maybe not institutionally a colony, but that's what China needs from Russia, only that. Only that. I, I was not talking about colony, I was talking no. about a type of yeah. colonial... Relation, yeah, I understand. Relation. Yeah, so Over I was, I was in a way supporting your view in, of course, I was supporting your view in, tra in, in, in pragmatic terms, not because it's imposed, but because that's what China needs from Russia. And, and the rest is not needed, frankly. I think uh, we should have a, a, how say it, a future prospect. Uh, for example, 30 years ago, uh, uh, and, uh, if there are anybody in the world uh, believe that in the in the 30 years the China will develop like, like such, so I think uh, in uh, uh, in uh, many respects uh, uh, Russia has more uh, I'll say uh, or has greater potential uh, than China 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, the higher educa the educational level. The, uh, the 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 vast uh, uh, the, the the natural resources, and uh, and everything. So I I I I I cannot exclude the uh, bright future for Russia in the next twenty or thirty years. So I uh, nowadays maybe you find that uh, limited uh, uh, fields for cooperation, but maybe in uh, five years we can we can uh, explore new ones. 
we have st still have st uh, time for some comments, I'm from the Russian mission to the European Union, Vasily Gavrilov. I was uh, very. It was very interesting to hear um, uh, and to to listen to the present to the presentations. But just a few comments concerning the business environment in Russia. There were significant reforms in Russia, and uh, I, I would have to remind you that in the do, do, doing business uh, ranking of the World, World Bank, in the last couple of years, Russia has jumped from the 92nd. Uh, to the 51st place. It's not, of course, perfect, but still this is a, f a very significant prog progress and we should not un underestimate it. Probably in, in, in one, two years we can be on the 20th or the 30th place because uh, it is a priority for, for the government of the Russian Federation. And concerning um, foreign investment and manufacturing, well, R Russia still has a rather developed manufacturing sector and uh, it is also true that we rely to a large extent of, on our internal investments because in the, in, in the previous re, uh, years Russia had really a lot of money uh, from its exports, exports and uh, this money uh, were invested into the manufacturing sector to, to, to a great extent. We were less dependent on foreign investments. While of course uh, they are always welcome and we welcome the Chinese investments to, uh, to Russia and I would not say that our re trade relationship is that imbalanced. Yeah, our, eco our economies are, are uh, indeed uh, complementary. This is not bad. This is uh, also the case for our relationship, trade, trade relations with the European Union. But uh, if you take oil and gas, their share in Russian exports, for example, is not 80%. It's around 60%, at least according to the latest data, January, uh, March. 2016, and the rest are other products, like uh, chemical products, agricultural products, machinery, which is around 6%. And from China, uh, the uh, share of machinery in, in our imports from China is around 50-53%, uh, I think, about that. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, well, I, I think uh, we should be cautious about your projections for future Chinese growth. Uh, because, uh, well, I didn't have time to mention that, but uh, according to our computations, the growth in industrial output in 2015 in China was zero. Official, six. So I think that tells you. And the other important thing is, what we find is that maybe the stagnation we are seeing now in China is very, very similar to what happened in Japan 20 or started in Japan 20 or even more years ago. So I think we should have two scenarios. You had the rosy one. There, maybe there is another one where we are not sure about the future, but we should be careful not to project okay. too quickly. I, I can't uh, give you any coffee before I respond because, <laughs> because Eric and I have been co-authors for a long time. So we've been going through this, but you... So, just one more. Yes, of course, I agree that China is slowing down, but, you know, that's industrial production. The service sector is already contributing more than half to Chinese growth. I'm not saying that... Uh, you need to be very rosy for China to contribute to global growth, double the US. So say it's not 14, say it's 10, still more than double the US. So the, my point was, yes, maybe the uh, total numbers, I may agree, we don't know what they are, but what we know is that in relative terms, China will continue to be bigger compared to the rest. That's what I was trying to say. And it's not about Russia, don't, don't take it on. Even more so if we talk about Europe, so, so it is just a natural fact, even if China decelerates massively. That, that's, that it has to decelerate so much for that trend to change that I just can't see it uh, no matter what. So anyway, we'll, so yes, coffee, coffee now. And we're back um, at um, 11.30, we're already. So, so we'll be late for the next session uh, for, say we have, 15 minutes, why not? Well, let's have 50, uh, next session will be brief. Our paper is very, very short. So we can have 15 minutes break.